Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the End of Pain Show, episode 123. Ronnie Flores here with my co-host, Chelsea Hopkins and Ani Umana, coming all the way from Israel and Texas. How you guys doing? Uh, man, good, good. We got the trio on the show today, so, yeah. you know, yeah. ready hey, for it. Uh, hopefully, you guys are doing good. <laughs> the trio always works. Obviously, a lot of stuff's happened. We always try to catch a normal week, but, like, every single week, something crazy happens, like... I just hope no celebrity hits anybody this week. I hope nobody in basketball uh, pulls a Juwan Howard oh, and hits man. anybody at the final four or anything like that. Like, can we just have a normal week? It's just always something going on. So, uh, right. Can, can we, can we start with the open, like the open, like these slaps? Like, I mean, just yeah. everyone just slapping each other. Yeah, I, I don't know what some of these slaps. Uh, you know, what? Let's talk about that real quick. What, what do you guys see? Like, what the hell is this fake? Is this? Are they just? Is he mad? Uh, you know, obviously it seemed now you look back at it, it seemed like he was really upset. But I mean, what did you guys first think when you saw that? Chelsea, you got it. Well, I actually, I didn't, yeah, I actually didn't get to see it live. Like I woke up to like Will Smith trending and I'm like, okay, like, okay, we're not canceling Will Smith. So let me go see what he did, like whatever it was. And, you know, after watching the video and, you know, hearing the joke and seeing his initial reaction, which I feel like he tried to laugh it off. But then yeah. when he saw Jada's reaction, he went into oh. defense mode, which I think any husband, you know, would do. Yeah. Um, obviously, I'm not saying that you should go up and slap somebody. But, you know, when you get mad, I think sometimes you see red and, you know, he's a human and he obviously very quickly got upset. Um, yeah. So I understand it. I'm not saying it's OK, but I definitely understand it. And, you know, seeing the nature of his jokes, you know, sometimes people say, Oh, well, you know, it's a comedian and they're just jokes like on Chris Rock's behalf. But my thing is, is like, you know, I, I think certain things are off limits, in, in my opinion. Like, sure. I feel like you can joke about somebody's decisions and the choices that they make. But if you joke about like a physical condition, you know, somebody having cancer, like somebody having, you know, she obviously has some type sure. of, uh, you know, disease that affects her, you know, being bald. And, and, and she did an interview like maybe you know semi recently just about how it affects her and how she's really insecure about it so yeah. um i think certain stuff like it has to be off limits and even though you know times are really sensitive i think as a comedian you kind of have to adjust to the time so i felt like it wasn't really a super appropriate joke considering you know jada coming out and talking about that uh but sure. i don't know if will should have <clears throat> handled it as he did on TV in front of everybody, but right, hey. right, yeah, I'm kind of I'm, I'm with you on it. Like I didn't think the joke was funny, uh, mm. but like you know, if I was Will, I was thinking like, yo, I would just went to the back and just raise hell in the back, like you know what I mean, yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, <clears throat> instead of doing it on that's because it just went away from him. You know, he won Best Actor. And yeah. that whole, it just kind of went away from that. But I understand being pissed about that. I mean, yeah. like I said, I, like you said, like I get it. Like you know, comedians obviously they don't, they can they don't really have a line that they cross. But I didn't think in the situation that wasn't the appropriate joke. It wasn't funny. Um, no, I agree. And, I agree. And then you know, but Will shouldn't have went up to him and slapped the hell out of him either. Right? <laughs> yeah, that was, <laughs> I, mean, I just, never thought it was fake though, because it's like when you see it, it's like no, like this is very real because he's mm-hmm. very upset. Like, right, right. Like you just see him laugh and smile, then all of a sudden walk up and just slap the hell out of him. I was just like, yeah. yeah. Well, you know what's some fake when he sat back down. That's the thing. The thing is crazy. Like Chelsea said, Will Smith's not going to get canceled. I think the man knows his like position in in Hollywood or in the social status. Like the crazy thing, he just went and sat back down in the seat like nothing happened. <laughs> right. And nothing like, did happen though. It's not like yeah. they said Will get up and leave the show. Yeah, he literally yeah, like, just. Sat back he, down. He, yeah, he cooled off, and it was like, okay, the show must go on. So, wow, wow. yeah, that's crazy. So, yeah, let's the show must go on for us because we could spend here talking all day about that. I mean, let's talk a little bit about the uh, spring coming up real quick. The high school scene is kind of wrapping down. All we have left is, you know, uh, state champions invitational and Geico, which is going to come up during the final four. Right. Uh, you know, I know you went to an event this weekend. You know, the the circuit event. What? Tell us a little bit about it and what was the format. And, you know, what did you see? Yeah, so the season ticket, they ran their uh, 
spring uh, tournament out in uh, Dallas out in the ASC in Carrollton. Or oh, Southwest Athletic Center is what it's called now, formerly ASC. And, uh, you know, it was a uh, – it was a really good event. You had high level teams. You had mass yeah. rivals, uh, Adidas team. You had Drive Nation, uh, John Lucas, another EYBL team, Texas Impact. Uh, sure. Um, was Utah Prospects. So you had a really, some really quality like shoe company teams and independent teams. Uh, you know, the format was a little different. So they actually did it the uh, high school like rules. So, well, it's like a mix of high school and NBA rules. So you did eight minute quarters. Wow. And uh, five team fouls each quarter, you shot two. So, uh, and then in the 17 level and one of the courts, you actually had a 30 second shot clock. So, you know, okay. it was it was really interesting. So, you got to see kids like play with a certain pace, have to make decisions quicker. Uh, yeah. Obviously, in Texas, we don't have a shot clock. So, uh, sure. in other places. So, you know, it was kind of an adjustment for some of the kids, especially some that played in high schools where they played a slower pace. But uh, you got to see quality basketball, and you, I got to see a lot of bad basketball with the shot clock. It's like a give or take. Sure. But it, it was a lot of good talent, um, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of good teams, a lot of good talent. I'm sure there was. Uh, tell us who you thought the three most impressive players were, you know, just, not, just from your <clears> class and guys who stood out and proved their stock, whatnot. Uh, I thought Zayden High, uh, 2023, uh, kid from Smithson Valley. Play for John Lucas. Uh, he was fantastic. Mm. He's grown three inches in the past uh, year. He's about six nine. Wow. He shoots the piss out of it. I mean, I think he made over 13 threes this weekend. Oh. Uh, high field. He's always had high field, like as a passer, finds backdoor cutters, you know, can read off handoffs and stuff like that. Got more athletic, like was blocking shots at his peak. Um, you know, he's a kid that's going to be a top 100 kid, uh, kid top 75 kid. Um, when the national wow. rankings come out, he was he was by far the best player in the gym uh, mm. that weekend. Uh, Utah prospects to have a, a player from Colorado Prep, uh, Bay Ndongo. I don't know if I'm saying it right, but I think I'm close enough. Yeah. Uh, about six nine, six ten, uh, forward skilled. You know, catch can catch in perimeter, rip through and finish. Athletic. You know, protects the uh, protects the rim well. You wish his motor was higher, but just the natural talent alone, he just oozes with a lot of upside. I thought he was uh, he was really really good. And then Mass Rivals, they have a kid, uh, uh, Jordan Clayton. He's a wow. 2023 uh, kid. He's uh, kind of just came out of nowhere. One for in my for me, you know, really shot the ball well, competed on the defense. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Mass Rivals coach. He's a uh, He's a character. <laughs> always yelling at. Always, you know, yeah. He gets on the guys pretty hard, and like he's a kid. Like he was just ripping him, like bad. Yeah. I'm like damn. Like you think the kid gonna say something? He just like yes, sir, and come in and makes three straight threes. You know, I was yeah. just impressed just with the composure, the shot making, uh, with the live dribble game, and just you know, just the way he competed on the defensive end. So those yeah. are three guys that really kind of stood out to me. Yes, you see that say that about mass rivals. I, I kind of know who you're talking about, and it. Just sometimes you see all this stuff early in the, in the AU season, like you hear on Twitter that some nine or eleven U coaches just cursing the other team out. And oh saying, yeah, why do we go through this? Like everybody's just too wild, you know. Just and that's my thing for this weekend. There was in Southern California, there was like three or four events, and I'm like, Ani, they're not, you know, like I'm gonna see those players at some point. Obviously, mm -hmm. the more you see them, the better. But at, at right now, I'm not gonna try to spend all my day. Just zigzagging across Southern California. I'm still in high school season, but you know that's coming to an end, and we're going to hopefully have Steve Smith on the uh, from Oak Hill talk a little bit about Geico and his high school journey, the last almost 40 years in, in the high school ranks, and and that scene has changed so much. Like you have these young guys that are trying to win games, seems more like developing. So yeah, I like to see the balance of that. You know, the guys who can. Uh, let the players play a little bit. So I'm kind of glad there was a shot clock. You said there was a shot clock. I wish more events had a shot clock. I know it's not easy to get to, but that seems to help out. Yeah, there there was a few good games I heard at Jerry Freitas' event, but there's so much events going on. Like you said, Ani, I think people are asking you, hey, uh, Ronnie, you coming to my event this weekend? Or, <laughs> Ani, you coming to my event? You're like, no, I'm going to the Final Four. <laughs> like, right, right. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it's, it's, over, it's over, Baron. We're going to see so much in the live periods coming up here. April 7th through 9th, then there's a week off, then we're going 20, I think 20, 22nd to 24th is the second mm -hmm. April live right. period. So it's it's coming up really quick. And like I said, we're still in the, in the high school realm. 
Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the high school realm, uh, Ani and Chelsea. The, the high school season finished up. You know, uh, we had state champions in, in Pennsylvania crowned, uh, Minnesota, uh, Indianapolis, Williamston, Michigan. Um, you know, Glen Bard West from, from Illinois might be the most compelling traditional state champ. They really had a terrific year. Uh, Gonzaga recruit Braden Huff, Bobby Durkin. Um, I think the most surprising team might be Col Columbus of Miami, Ohio. I'm sorry, Miami, Florida. When I say Miami, Ohio, Miami, Florida. Uh, they knocked out Dr. Phillips, who had a really good team. And, and Columbus has Cameron Boozer and Caden Boozer, uh, who's Carlos Boozer's son. Sons, and for, they beat them 45 44. Caden hit free throws in the final seconds. So, Ani, on a, on a national scale, what team surprised you the most, or which team were you most interested in watching? Like, you know, that maybe surprised you a little bit. I, I thought Columbus was surprising. I, I saw them in the fall. Yeah. And, and they were good. And I saw and I saw that they came out to an event in Las Vegas. And obviously, uh, Cameron's might be the best 225 I've seen so far. But what, what team has surprised you? Uh, I guess, you know, just overall, you know, Bishop Gorman just kind of making the run they did. Obviously, they did end with a, a, a state title, but just kind of going undefeated. Uh, I wouldn't say they had down years, but they, you know, they just – I mean, who would expect them to be, you know, <laughs> get get to, get to that point? Yeah. Um, definitely a uh, faith family, uh, okay. you know, around here, you, you, you know, yeah. losing a kid like Jordan Walls, uh, you yeah. know, from the last time they won a state title, they don't have the MVP, the, you know, two key guys, which is Jordan Walls and Trey Clayton. Sure. And so for me, just mm -hmm. seeing faith family just bounce back and kind of being in that top, you know, top 50 uh, team in the country again, it's just yeah. – it was impressive for me, especially when you lose a kid that's, you know, you know, we saw him at the McDonald's All American <laughs> practice scrimmages. So that's yeah. impressive. That just shows a good, what a good job BT has done. Well, you mentioned Faith Family and the Tarkanian guys like Grant Rice. They were saying, you know, asking me, hey, this team's going to be in our tournament. What do you think? I go, they go, they lost your eyes out. They're going to be good. Like, don't just put them in, receive them right. They're going to be good. And Obviously, they had a big lead on Liberty, but they lost it. You know, Faith, Faith Family like could really be like you said they're good, but they could really be higher. They had a big lead on Liberty. They did, yeah. And then they had a big lead on Gorman a week later in San Diego at the Tory Pines. They had a huge lead, like a nineteen point lead. So, oh wow! Yeah, you know, Bishop Gorman being young, obviously Jace Richardson, Jason Richardson's sons two twenty four, Junie Mobley's two twenty four. Chris mm -hmm. Woolley's 225, so like they're going to be really good next year. I know they're going to be motivated because they lost in that state final to, right. and they lost their chance to play in the state champions invitational by losing. So I mean, they kind of mentioned it. They're they're they're, they're not happy about that loss. You know, <laughs> yeah, but they're not. Uh, ten in a row. Yeah, they won ten straight championships. They hadn't lost a championship since Shabazz Muhammad was a junior. That's a, quite a while. Oh ago. wow, that's 2011. They right, got yep. when he was a junior and. Yeah, he's a 2012 kid. That's yeah, right. he's a 2012 kid. Yep. So the, you can remember that, but yeah, time goes on. But no, yeah, Faith Family was did a really good job. I'm glad they won their state champion. I know they were favored. Speaking of the McDonald's game, let's switch to that. Chelsea, I wanted to ask you a question. I don't know if you saw it. Um, a girl won the dunk contest again, and yes, you know, it's kind of like I saw her dunk, and the other girls were kind of like excited for her but they kind of were faking it almost it's like <laughs> i think that the the since, since candace parker won the dunk contest it was like okay that was awesome but i think the girls have kind of stepped up the bar like the next girl is going to seem to have to do a little bit more what, what do you think yeah you know what um i think i'm, I'm happy to see you know the girls game evolving I, i'm one that has always said the, the women's game will evolve itself you know we've always had these talks about Hey, lower the goals, make them eight feet, do these kind of things. Women need to dunk, women need to make it more interesting. So, yeah. you know, I, I'm very excited to see that we have girls now that are able to dunk um, yeah. so easily. You know, that South Carolina recruit, like it was very light, obviously, the dunk that she did. But, you yeah. know, a dunk contest, like, you know, it's there's kind of starting to get watered down. And sure. not even so much just in the McDonald's game, but in the NBA. Like, yeah. we're not even impressed with those dunk contests anymore. Right. So, I don't really think that we need to do the participation um, trophy of having a girl in the dunk contest because, right. you know, she's a girl. Like, girls are dunking now. And, right. you know, let it be a contest. Let it be the most competitive <clears throat> contest it could possibly be. And obviously, at this point, it would, you know, you have to have boys players for that. Um, sure. I, I'm excited that they allow women to participate. But also, you know, it, it should it shouldn't just be 
let's give her tens because she's able to dunk now. Because I think oh. that it's going to be very, very normal um, yeah. very soon. Like we have girls in college, like Fran Belibi, right. uh, Stanford. She dunked in the game the other day. Like this is going to become a thing pretty soon. So yeah. I think we're getting past the point of just having women in it just to be in it. Yeah. Um, and now we can either have a minute or we can just, you know, try to make the dunk contest the best that we can possibly make it and put the, you know, the high flying guys in it. Um, sure. Just my opinion. Yeah. I, I noticed that because I saw the her dunk and I saw the I saw when like when Candace Parker dunked, all the guys jumped up. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. Sebastian, Dwight Howard. They were like, oh, my yeah. God. They don't have that reality. Like you said, the, the, the game is elevated for them. And that's a great mm -hmm. thing. Like the expectations are much higher. You can't just. Can't just dunk, you know, like right. You can't just get yeah, it over the and, and, and everybody's yeah, and, gonna go crazy. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So, what you so you know. Yeah, no, I, I I agree on that. Like it's gotten to a point that the game has definitely evolved for the women. Yeah. You know, especially like playing above the rim from when yeah. Candace Parker participated. So mm -hmm. like yeah. you, you kind of not even I'm gonna say doing this disservice, but like. When girls, women can dunk. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like you know, just because she put it on, like, it, it's not all tens. Like, you know, they she, yeah. they can do more than that. You know? Yeah, yeah. correct. So, but we got to make them do the more than that, like you said, by giving them sevens or giving right. them it's like, yeah, yo, you can put it over the rim, like, you got to <laughs> off the backboard or something. Like, that's what I thought. You know? Uh, so, Audi, I know you caught a little bit of the scrimmage. Like, we talked about Jordan Walsh. Uh, what, what do you see so far? The McDonald's game, when you guys listen to this pod, will be on Tuesday night about, I think it's about uh, 6 p.m. Eastern. No, I'm sorry, about 9, 8 p.m. Eastern, the game will come on. And the women's game obviously precedes it on ESPN2 and and the guys' game uh, on ESPN. But, Ani, what did you see with the scrimmage and, and who stood out? Yeah, no, I thought the uh, scrimmage kind of started out a little slow. Guys sure. were kind of um, excuse me, kind of struggling uh, scoring. But uh, yeah. I thought it got going towards uh, – Towards the middle of the end of it, uh, Brandon Miller, you know, was really impressive. Uh, okay. I think he's going to Alabama, about six yeah. eight, has guard skills, shoots it, long arms. Uh, he was the most impressive player to me uh, yeah. in the scrimmage. I really yeah. liked how uh, Brandon Miller was. Nick Smith, um, you know, I know yeah, ESPN awesome. has him as the top uh, rankable prospect in that uh, twenty two class as far as NBA. Um, you know, shifty guard, really uh, can score. You know mid-range three he knows how to get guys involved i really like nick uh, i was actually talking to his dad the other day you know really good kid and really good yeah. people but i thought he was impressive uh khalil Ware is like the most like he has the most upside in my opinion out of every everybody you wow. know just seven foot a little over seven foot long arms you know I wasn't around, obviously, at the time when Wilt Chamberlain and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar played. But, like, some of the moves mm -hmm. and stuff he does, I'm just like, that, you know, from what I've seen, like, yeah. the old games, I'm like, that's something they would do, you know? Yeah, like, sure. like just weird, unorthodox hook shots and lays mm -hmm. and dunks that just, like, yeah. how the hell did that – how the hell were you there to dunk it? And, you know, you know, just – like blocking, like he had a play where he blocked a shot at his peak. And then, you know, Derek Lively, who's, you know, ranked number one in the country, sure. uh, most, uh, most national polls, like he, then he like got back up and blocked his dunk, you know, dunk attempt. So it's like, mm -hmm. you know, Khalil Ware, he's someone that, I mean, just always is with time. He's in Arkansas. I, I remember him, he would come to a scout focus camp when he was in seventh grade and yeah. couldn't walk and chew bubble gum. And now, yeah. You know, <laughs> McDonald's All American. So, you know, Brandon Miller, Khalil Ware, Nick Smith, uh, yeah. Jarace Walker, I really like a lot. Um, yeah. So, those are guys that kind of stood out to me. Yeah, it's funny. Nick Smith and Khalil Ware, you wonder them at North Little Rock, like, how did they lose a the game, you know, playing right. the game together? Like, Jonesboro must have really played their butt off. Obviously, losing to IMGs, you know, it's formidable. And then Calvary Christian. So, I think to your point, Calvary Christian's got to be that heavy favorite in that state champions invitation. Oh, they sure. beat North Little Rock. Um, you know, Adi, this year seems like because Jalen Duran is in college and he played for Memphis, and we obviously saw him in the tournament. Uh, this is wide open. Like, is anybody is there any clear cut number one? Do you think Derek is clear cut number one, or do you think no? Like, it, it you know, we'll see what happens with them in college and in the pros, but 
what do you think about this class 220? Just there's yeah. not star power that there has been in previous classes for obvious reasons. Guys left, for sure. You know, for sure. Like Shade Out Sharp, who left, uh, mm -hmm. who I think would be more of a clear number one if he stayed in that class. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I, I don't think there's a clear number one. Obviously, I think you kind of just go with Lively because he's kind of been the yeah most consistent, especially at the top. Uh, yeah. You know, Keontae George kind of has has a say in that. To me, I, I really like Nick Smith. Nick Smith would be my number one. Wow. Um, yeah. I, I just really like how he is as a guard. He's tough as hell. He just gets a lot done. Um, Derek Whitehead obviously is in contention. Uh, I know Flipikowski, who's uh, – right, am I saying his last name correct? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, who's going to Duke. Uh, him, like you got about – Five, six guys, you know, Chris Livingston some days looks like he could be number one just with his two-way ability. Uh, Khalil Ware, when he's playing really hard, looks like. Bonnie, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, now you're like at about seven guys. <laughs> right, I'm on, I, I, I may go to 15 if I keep round, <laughs> round yeah, on May, like, so. And I think that's the whole point of my question. Like, there is yeah. maybe not number uh, clear cut. Maybe set Derek like, kind of leads the pole position. Obviously, Brady Dick was the Gatorade National Player of the Year. Right. Uh, I think Derek won the Morgan Wooten Award. We'll see with Mr. Basketball USA, the one I've been doing now. I, when we have the voting with, with the panel, well, I, I, we'll see who comes out. It might not be one of those two guys. Right. It could be, and we'll still see what, what happens in the McDonald's game, who plays well. But I like the scrimmage. I like watching the scrimmage. I used to like watching the practice when I go more than the game. But it's still fun to see the game and see what happens. Um, so that, that will be when you guys are listening to this pod. I'm sure you'll be watching that game and then getting into the Geico nationals a few days later before the final four chelsea let's talk a little bit switch gears about the the women's final four uh yeah. kind of similar to the men's final four in that the big dogs the 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 blue buds if you call them the the top seeds have, have kind of advanced through and it's kind of expected did that go as you expected uh or as most people expected did anything was there anything unexpected um, you know, I think for the most part in the final four, it was pretty expected. Um, you know, number one seeds usually get through two seeds, you know, on the women's side. I will say we had a lot more parity in some of the earlier, you know, round of uh, 32 and like a couple upsets and surprises that people were um, kind of taken back by. Uh, Creighton did very well, uh, beat a couple good teams. So, you know, we definitely had a couple upsets and just very interesting games. Like I felt like there was a lot of competitive um uh, matches and you know a lot of people locked into them but for the most part I think based on people's brackets and what people predicted um, maybe a, a couple teams could have snuck in there I know some people had Iowa because Caitlin Clark you know uh, sure. one of the runners up for player of the year uh, but for the most part South Carolina has been there all season uh, number one overall seed they're going to take on Louisville who is another number one um, and then on the other side you have Stanford and UConn so UConn slipped in as a two seed realistically um if they didn't have the injuries and the stuff that they kind of suffered for earlier in the season they probably would have came in number one like they usually do sure. um but well, when i look at the final four now you know south carolina kind of has breezed through the tournament and breezed wow. through the you know regular season they ended up losing in the sec uh, championship to kentucky but for the most part uh that little uh, loss kind of uh, elevated them their margin of victory in the tournament is like 20 points a game oh, um they yeah. have oh, wow. Yeah, they they have the uh, the leading national player of the year candidate in Aaliyah Boston. She's a you know walking double double. Um, had a big game in the tournament, twenty eight points, twenty two rebounds um, against North Carolina. So uh, they have her leading the way. Uh, I look at Louisville. Louisville plays super hard. They're guarding like crazy. Uh, two elite, well, elite guard in, in Van Leith, and then they have a, um, a small forward in Emily Inglister, who is also very special senior who actually um, is going to enter the draft this year. So, you know, they have some veteran leadership. They have some young talented guards. So, you know, it'll be, it should be a decent matchup. Uh, when I look at Stanford, just always steady, very sure. well coached, um, you know, Tara Vanderbeer getting it done over there. Um, smart team. Like you're not basically, you have to beat them because they don't really make too many mistakes for, for them to beat themselves. Uh, they have the size, they have the length. Um, Haley Jones is a, a candidate for National Player of the Year as well. And then they have Cameron Brink, who's also very talented. Um, and last but not least, UConn. I mean, everybody knows UConn is pretty much always in the mix. Um, yeah. I think this is – they have, a, I think, 16 Final Four appearances now that they ended up slipping past NC State yesterday. Um, yeah. It was a very good game, went into double overtime. I honestly thought that NC State had them. 
um, in regulation, the game was wow. uh, tied at the end and they had the ball. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, they weren't able to get a clean look going to the first overtime. They looked like they were doomed. They come back, tie it with a three and then go into the second um, overtime. And it was pretty much uh, the Paige Becker show. Uh, you know, she's their sophomore sensation who yeah. missed a great chunk of the season, but, you know, came back right in time for the conference tournament and the NCAA tournament. Um, they also have freshman um, AZ Fudd, who's very talented, and senior Kristen Williams. So, you know, they have the experience, they have the coaching, yeah. they have the pedigree. Um, sure. So they're always going to be there. But if I had to give my prediction, I say South Carolina and Stanford are going to meet in the championship. And I have South Carolina bringing it home and Don Staley getting her second championship hey. with the Gamecocks. Wow. Yeah. That is heavyweight teams. Uh, you know, was that NC State? UConn getting like the ending was it controversial? No, it, it was just UConn. I I, I don't know if it was controversial, but like the refs were not good, and and, and there was questionable calls. In my opinion, there was questionable calls on both sides. So it's like yeah. it's hard to say. Like you know, yeah. like both of UConn's bigs were in foul trouble. Yeah. Like multiple, yeah. they both had four fouls. So then at the end of the game, the NC State girl drives to the basket. She clearly gets fouled, but they don't call it because the girl would foul out. Like you know, so there's different things that happen. But at the end of the day, in my opinion, um, Paige Beckers, she brought it home and she stole the show. Like, I, I didn't really see too many great adjustments by NC State uh, with Paige in the ball screen. You know, in, in the first overtime, she had eight straight points. Oh, and, it, wow. it, you know, she's four for four. She's coming off the screen. She's hitting the jump shot and they're just kind of allowing it. So, I mean, I think it's pretty easy to say, well, you know, if the Rebs did this and did that. But pa Paige won that game for them, basically. Wow. Yeah. They said the good play. Oh, it's more prominent than the rest. I think that kind of balanced out on the guy side too. Like we were talking about the rest a lot in the early rounds, but in the later rounds, it wasn't as prominent. Like yeah. the better teams and the teams that can score won. But and what's that up with the refing though? Like just yeah, across cool. the board, like <laughs> NBA, college, my <laughs> game last night in Israel. It's like, yeah. yo, it's insane. <laughs> well, what I've seen yeah. is <laughs> quick tees, like these quick tees on dunks and or like, like what is with these quick tees? Like, it's just it's ego the thing. Well, the emotional part is way worse on the women's side. Like you see a girl yell and one and try to show a little passion. It's an automatic tech. Damn. Now I've seen now I've seen in these high school games though too, like kids are dunking and yeah. barely hanging on the rim and stuff and calling a tech. Like, don't do that. Like it just yeah. takes all the fun like out of yeah. the game. Like really just let it be yeah. about basketball. Like uh -huh. Yeah. They're not hanging on the rim for like 10 seconds or no. yeah. you know, they yell and one and like, why are you giving them a text? Yeah, just just like let it go. Crazy. If you want to give them a little warning, cool. Like, yeah. but you know, I think stuff like that throws off. Like even this past weekend, you saw some stuff. Like I saw some stuff and I'm like, man, you could have let that go. Like now the, no, the game dictated and you and Ronnie, you know how it is, especially with summer events. Like yeah. if someone loses a game and it was a close game. They got a tech, you know, as an event director, you're hearing it. And then they're raising, you know, it just correct. I don't know. It's just I get that ref again later that evening or yeah. something. Right. It, it causes some problems. We've seen some problems it's caused, you know, in gyms all over the country for sure. It, not just in one area. It's 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 and there's shortage of refs, you know, with the pandemic and right. we've lost some refs, you know, and some refs didn't have the health to come back. And then there's not a lot of young refs coming along. Like they gotta be treated better, they gotta <laughs> do a better job. It's like then the pay comes into play. Like, I think most high school refs get paid about 65, 75 bucks. Right. A game, maybe more. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, that's, you know, with the gas is, they, they're going to want gas money just to go to the mm -hmm. game soon. Mm -hmm. Like, it's it's a lot of factors. Oh, yeah. Over here, you got to pay them gas money. So, like, yeah. Yeah. So, like, when I scheduled referees, it was 75. And then, depending how far they traveled, I had to give them yeah. gas. So, it may be $100 mm -hmm. a referee. Oh, yeah. Wow. That's going to go up. And then it's going to cause more tension. They're going to be more, you know, like, <laughs> For sure, because I've 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 had to get a ref as well for a ball of life event. Where then I'm like, they're like I'm like it's in certain part of Orange County. Like Ronnie, it, it, gas is expensive, and like that's the first time they mm -hmm. said that in the last like six months. That was never a problem before, you know. So that's going to continue to be an issue. Obviously, we'll we'll see how that goes, and hopefully the refing across the board uh, just continues to improve. I I, I know we we focus a lot on <coughs> the tournament, so we focus on it, but you know. It, it, it got to improve all the way around. And then Absolutely. that's why people say in the NBA, like there's a reason they're NBA refs, like, cause they're, they're the best, you know, like 
It's gonna yeah, be but are they the best? The NBA refs have been kind of questionable too lately. <laughs> it has been. It really has been. I mean, maybe there's somebody better out there. I, I you know, who, who, I'm not sure, Chelsea. It, 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 you're right. Is this is this like a a referee thing where we're just gonna be bad so they can pay us more to do good? Hmm. Something. There needs to be some type of consequences. If you like, like really mess up a game or something, like I don't know, something has to give. Like, I'm not saying you can't make mistakes and stuff, yeah. but sometimes they miss blatant calls or things that really can alter a game. And it's just, it's not fair. Because especially in the NBA, you know, unlike any other scenario, they had the, the two-minute report, like, for the right. end of the game. And sometimes the report will say, oh, yeah, Ani missed yeah. this call. And right. the right. one minute and 13 seconds, you're like, well, you cannot miss that call. Like, yeah. you know, what if that was the one possession I needed or the one stop I needed or the one basket? Like, that's the part that I hate because they just basically say, yeah, we messed up, but y'all lost. Like, the right. next game, you know? What I don't understand is maybe, like you said, maybe because it's the pay and there's too many to pay, especially with these big events. Why doesn't re- – I always thought that when I was little before I even knew much about basketball. I was like, why is the ref not more status? Like, why – a better athlete. In other words, mm-hmm. the same age as the as – the, yeah. As the player, right. I see them out of position a lot. It's like they didn't see and that tired, a little out of shape, out of yeah. position, and out of shape. Yeah, yeah. we see it. I, I don't. Yeah. Those are ref. Those are ref. That uh, he um, he was on the main court, and he he went up to the scores table. I was there. He said, "This court's too big for me. I'm not gonna be able to keep up." And he had four games. <laughs> like he, he said, "I'm not gonna be able to keep up." <laughs> hey, at least he's wow. honest. I like hey, it. I mean, yeah. But that's not Maybe good. you guys could just stand him at half court and he can do the best he can. Who knows? Right. That's crazy. And he, and he would tell us, like, I know I missed it. Like, I wasn't going to be able to get there. <laughs> like, yeah. like, just straight honest. I'll be uh, – Chelsea, I'll be honest with you. Uh, one time at Clark High School here in Vegas, uh, I saw this girl, and I knew she had never done the book before. She was completely mm-hmm. overwhelmed. It was an event, one of the – you know, of one of the many summer events. And I sat down, and I just happened to sat down, and I was like, I told the rep, yo, I kind of pointed just like, you have to come to the table and give her the number. And because, mm-hmm. especially in the summer, they'll do it from the other side. Like, right, right. right. And the girl's like, what number was that? I was like, oh, she, she, she oh, doesn't man. know. I felt really yeah. bad. First, I told the rep, like, yo, you got to come to the table. And he was, he got really mad. Like, he wanted to fight me mad. And I was like, yeah, but why are you mad? Because coming to the table is what you're actually supposed to do. I know you want to take the shortcut and, you know, give me right. the right. away. Yeah, yeah. What, what is yeah, yeah, like, That's crazy. Yeah, it was pretty It was pretty good. But, like, that's where we're at. So hopefully it proves a lot. I don't want to talk too much more about the rest. <laughs> but, we, you know, like, that's one of the kind of uh, before we get Steve Smith on here and talk about the high school uh, and, and his fabulous career, uh, Chelsea, I, we kind of mentioned it with Kelsey Bone. I kind of mentioned it. You know, um, I've always thought that, and we talk about the popularity of the game. I always thought that uh, Pat Summit was kind of like uh, uh, Adolf Rupp. And like you mentioned, where the game is progressing, I always thought Gino was kind of like John Wooden. Mm-hmm. And like he's been, like you said, to that many Final Fours in a row. And obviously, we haven't reached that Michigan State, Indiana moment, in my opinion, in girls basketball. We're like, the world is just fixated by these two girls or these rivals. And I hope that comes to the girls game one day and it'll help populate the, or popularize the pro game. Uh, because that's really what happened in the college game. Like magic and birds championship is still the most watched college game of all time. So in, in your, in your opinion, is that like what Gino's doing in, you know, 15 or 14 straight final fours, is that good for the women's game? Is there enough parody or do, do people follow the, UConn's in Tennessee's and, and now Louisville's in Stanford. Well, I, I think now there's more parity in the game. And, and you're seeing that with the recruits. I okay. mean, you know, when I was basically coming out, you know, everybody's trying to go to UConn and Tennessee Same. and you sure. can pretty much count on one hand, you know, the programs that everybody was trying to go to, because at that time, those were the programs that were producing the most WNBA yeah. players. Even if it wasn't because these girls should be in the WNBA, it's because of, you know, this is where they came from. So if you had that dream of actually doing it, then you're, you know, looking to go to these schools. But but now you see, like, if you go down the top 100 recruits or top 50 recruits, like, programs are getting players. Like, Caitlin Clark stayed home. She went to Iowa. 
Like they are, these girls are spreading out. You're seeing how it's becoming super competitive. Um, you're having top teams in different conferences and, and everybody's not running to the Tennessee's and the, and the UConn and, and the UNC's anymore. Like I, I feel South Carolina has really become a powerhouse as of lately. Oh, yes. um, you know, Don Staley obviously won a national championship and, you know, might be on her way to her second. But, you know, I, I think it's spreading out. Um, I think right. it's awesome for the women's game. But I didn't think it was bad for the game when Gino and them were dominating. Like, right. you know, in my opinion, beat them. Yeah. Like, beat them. Yeah. If you want something to stop or not continue, like, you, you have to beat them. And, yeah. you, know, it, 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 you know, you have to get the recruits. You have to get the players. And you have to put in the work to, to make your team substantial. And I think a team that we kind of leave out sometimes is Stanford. Because oh, yeah. Tara Vanderveer has, has done that. You know, she doesn't right. have maybe the the trophies that Gino does, but her sure. team is in the mix every single year. She's getting yeah. players, you know, she's building a program um, and they're always in the mix and always have the opportunity to win. And that's really just what you can hope for. You know, yeah. truthfully, everybody can't win the championship. And even this year, it's only going to be one team. Yeah. So you'd have to build that culture and make it competitive. And I think um, a lot of the, you know, programs are starting to do that now. Me oh, personally, yeah. what I'd really like to see is just um, a lot of black women head coaches is becoming a lot more <laughs> prominent um, sure. in the women's game. And, you know, I just like to see that being a black woman, you know, there's nothing wrong with, you yeah. know, anybody coaching, but just for me, you know, to see these women step up and, and stand to the forefront. And, and that's why I really liked what Don Staley's doing, because even though she's been having a lot of individual success or success with her program that she's built, she's been, you know, spreading the knowledge to the other coaches that are, you know, kind of on their way trying to do the same thing. Um, she had this, you know, she won her national uh, championship and she took a piece of the net and she sent it to all the head uh, black coaches in, in, in Division One basketball yeah. just to say, hey, like, we're here. We're doing it. Step up. Take your program here. Like, you know, not necessarily follow me, but I, I want to see more people that are doing what I'm doing. So sure. the women's game, in my opinion, is in great hands. Um, right. These players are showing what they can do. We're finally starting to, you know, spread some of the coverage out and, and yeah. who the media is is focusing on. And I think really that's the biggest thing. Like sometimes we right. have to, you know, spotlight uh, other programs that are doing good things um, that you may not really know about. And, and we saw that in the tournament with Creighton. Like Creighton was awesome. And they had the best storyline, in my opinion, because they had a girl, I believe her name was Lauren Jensen, a transfer from Iowa. And she oh, wow. hit the game-winning shot for Creighton to beat Iowa to advance yeah. to the next round. That's a big so story. It's like, yeah. It, yeah, it's stories <laughs> like that that is going to elevate women's basketball. Right. And sure. the story doesn't always have to come from UConn or, or Tennessee. Like, let, let's dig into the transfer portal because all these kids yeah. are transferring. And, you know, yeah. maybe the kids came from UConn or Tennessee. We don't know. But right. there, there's good stories out there. Women's basketball is in good hands. And, you know, I'm excited to, to see what happens in the Final Four. Yeah, exactly. And like you said, you you got to beat like slay the dragon or beat them. Yeah. Uh, so so you got to give credit to, to Gino. I think Steve Smith is a little like that when he built his program to where they were winning national championships. It's like now there's a lot of programs at that level, you know, Montverde, Sunrise. But like when he came along, that was the standard bearer. Ani, did you ever go to the um, Nike Academy when you were little to watch them play or any like, you know, when did you did you see them when they went down there in the early 2000 play like Nick Wise or any of those guys. Uh, did you go to see uh, Oak Hill play? No, I didn't. Uh, okay. But I, I've I've heard about you know, yeah, that you know Oak Hill has always been basically they they kind of were the standard. Sure. Uh, yeah, and, you know, and I know the early teams in the early styles. That's when you know <clears throat> you had like Mello, <laughs> all of them, and yeah, yeah. But I never got a chance to. I, I wanted to, but I never got a chance. To. Yeah, they went down to that Nike Academy in the early 2000s a bunch when they had Melo. Uh, Chelsea, I don't know if you saw them. It, like, Cheyenne had a really good team in, like, probably your ninth grade year, 04. Okay. Uh, who yeah, was on the team then? I'll say that again. Who was on the Who was on the team then? Ooh, ooh I'd have to think. But that was, like, maybe the best non-Gorman team, really? like, in Vegas in a long time. Like, mm -hmm. and they played Oak Hill. And like you said, it was kind of like a standard to see how good people were. Like, mm -hmm. okay, how good is your team? Well, if you guys play Oak Hill, you'll know. You'll find out. Yeah. They beat some really good teams. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, he's had some losses, and I think Steve Smith, most of his losses have come since, like, these other academies have been good. Like, they would hardly ever lose one or two games, you know, in in those days. He didn't have – he had many seasons where he just had one loss. Or you would talk about, like, 
he's won the Fat 50 Championship seven times and wow. won two other titles, or like probably nine titles. But like, he's one win away from like having like 15. You know, so that's it's very yeah. interesting. Like, it's a standard bearer. Like, and I think, like you said, the women's game has grown. the The top level teams have grown because now other teams are are winning, beating each other. They have mm-hmm. three, four losses, five losses, and like you may say, oh, well, those teams are not as good. I you know. I just think all the teams are better. You know, yeah, what I, mean? so, I agree. Yeah, let's bring in Coach Deesman. I think we have him now uh, here. Coach, are you there? This is Ronnie. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can uh, hear you. How's it going, Coach? Good. How are you? I appreciate you uh, jumping on, joining our In the Paint show. Appreciate you jumping on for like the third or fourth time now. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for taking your time. Uh, Coach, I just want to get uh, right into it. Uh, how's everything going? And are you, I know you guys are getting ready to go to Geico. When are you guys taking off? We fly out tomorrow morning at about nine nine o'clock out of Charlotte, so we we'll have to leave school here about five in the morning. Gotcha. Oh, wow. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah, and, it, and for people that don't know, you know, Charlotte Airport's what like a two and a half hour ride down the hill. It's about two hours. Two hours. Yeah, I've, I've been there. It's a beautiful, beautiful view when you go down or back up that hill. Uh, I know you've seen all that stuff a thousand <laughs> times. You see it every every time you go up and down the hill. But when you when you first got there as an assistant at Oak Hill. This is 83, 84. Uh, did you ever envision you would stay as long as you did? You know, what were your plans then? It maybe is in your mid twenties. You know, what, what did you envision at that time? Yeah. My plan was to coach a few years and hopefully get a college job. So, uh, and I was here as an assistant for two years. Yeah. Took over in 85. And, uh, about two years later, I was offered an assistant job at VCU and turned it down. And then about a year later, I was offered a job at Pitt, turned that down. Uh, a couple years later, got offered a job at Pitt again, Oregon, uh, Louisville in the mid nineties. Um, that was the closest I came to leave and I'm from Kentucky. Uh, yeah, originally Wilmore, Kentucky, which is in the central part, about 10 miles from Lexington. Okay. And, uh, my kids were in uh, high school at the time. My daughter was a senior rising senior. My son was a rising junior and I didn't feel like that was the good time to leave. Um, late in their high school career. So I ended up staying. That was, I think it was in 90, around 98, 99, somewhere in there. That's the last time I even entertained leaving. So um, looking back on, I'm glad I stayed as long as I have. Okay. So yeah, it's a totally different world, college basketball, recruiting, and the landscape and the way it is now, it's, whew, it's, it's, uh, it's completely changed. And uh, of course it's changed in high school too, but um, so I've been here 39 years. So that's kind of hit the nutshell. Yeah. I, like you said, you, you didn't want to up. Did maybe, did you look at the college game? Like, okay, I may have to move three, four times in yeah. my thirties and forties. I, I maybe don't want to do that. Is that kind of where you were thinking? That's exactly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. M- most of them don't care, but I had a family and yeah. two kids and I didn't want to uproot every couple of years. And most of those situations, uh, the VCU job when I almost left, uh, Tubby had called me. Tubby Smith was the assistant there, and he had left. I was going to take Tubby's spot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he told me the coach was good for two years. Well, the coach was fired in December. <laughs> so I would have been there four months, and who knows what would have happened there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It pit. I was going with Paul Evans, and he left. He got fired. Like, the second time I thought about going, seriously, the first time I didn't. But uh, he got fired that year, too. So, you know, you'd be moving all the time and jumping around and – uh chasing jobs and some people like doing that. Uh, not necessarily, you know, things aren't always green on the other side, like people think. And uh, they yeah. always go, why'd you stay there? Why'd you go to college? Why'd you do this? Uh, I think I, we built something here. We had a legacy in almost 40 years. Yeah, for sure. Coach, talk a little bit about um, where it is. I, I, I've been up there and I, I went to your guys' ceremony and whatnot for one of your national championship yeah. teams. And, uh, but what was it like in the mid '80s? You know, the surrounding communities are still small. Yeah. You know, so what was it like when you got there? I mean, was is the school been built up? Is the is there a little bit more population? Has it been the same? Is it is the road, more roads? What what has you know what is it? What was it like when you got there? Yeah, it's uh, it's changed a little. The schools, the schools very similar. Um, <laughs> several new buildings, you know. From when I first came, a new academic building, a bunch of new dormitories, new housing for faculty. Um, so the, the campus has changed a little bit as far as that through the years. Um, 
enrollment's a little smaller actually than it was back then. Oh. Uh, it's very expensive to go to Oak Hill if you're not a mm. if you don't receive any aid. It's forty five thousand dollars to go here. So, um, oh, wow, wow. It's a prep. Well, we're the cheapest boarding school on the East Coast. So believe it or not, at that at that rate. So, um, the school's pretty similar. The surrounding area. It's grown up a little bit. I, I lived on campus for 20 years, uh, a little over 20 years. Wow. Now I live in a log cabin development about four miles away. Uh, it's This area now is kind of a, I wouldn't say retirement area, but a vacation home, vacation area for mm -hmm. everybody where I live is from Florida. They all move up here from Florida. Some are retirees. Some will come six, eight times a year. And there's probably, oh, man, I don't know how many log cabin developments in our area because we're in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Yeah. So where I live, there's probably 100 log cabins out there, different sizes. Uh, and my, uh, both my sisters live in another log cabin development. So it's, it's a vacation area now. It's changed. It used to be pretty isolated. Now it's a lot of people come up here from the south to get away from the heat in the summer. And they'll spend the summer up here and then they'll go back to Florida for the for the winter time, especially the people that are retired. So um, it's, a, and then the towns of, I think a couple of the towns have grown up a little bit. They're, they're tourist traps too. Uh, people come up in the fall to see the leaf change. People come up in the summer to get on the river and uh, they build a golf course about 15, 18 miles from my house. It's really high level. That's good mm -hmm. for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good for me. I, yeah. I have better golf than I had when I first moved up here. <laughs> There's yeah. a couple, it's a flat course in the mountains, so I like that. Gotcha. So, Cuz, you uh, you talked about when you uh, just going back, but you, you turned down the uh, job at Louisville. Uh, is that the point where you knew you were going to be at Oak Hill for the like the long haul? Yeah, because I was about oh, I was about 43, 44 years old at that time, and uh, my kids were getting ready to go to college, and so I, I either leave it then or you're going to stay pretty much because you're getting older. Mm -hmm. and, uh, at that point, I really didn't want to go out and recruit. I like people, people, people accuse me of recruiting here, but I just answered the phone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I tell them, I, these guys will recruit guys for six months. I'll get a McDonald's all American with one phone call. They'll yeah. recruit a guy for six months and he'll go somewhere else. And that, that could be me on the other side of my desk trying to yeah. get those kids. So I have it a little easier. And, uh, you know, I've had, I know college coaches haven't had any McDonald's all Americans. I've had 34, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, wow. never had a pro player. I mean, I'm talking about Division One co colleges that right. old mid, they never had a pro player. And I've had close to 40. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it depends on what you're looking at. If you want to make more money, yeah, you leave. If you're happy right. where you are and you're making enough money and you're satisfied, then I decided to stay. Yeah. I like that. I can always make more money, but, but yeah. I make enough money. It's not like they don't pay me here. I've got camps and side hustles and those kind of things where you can make money. And, uh, you know, I'm a fairly prominent high school coach, so you can make it. It's a lot better job pay-wise than it was in 1985. I'll put it there. <laughs> <laughs> and, Coach, you talked about, uh, you know, McDonald's All-Americans and uh, pros that you have, uh, obviously, you know, what comes to mind, like Jerry Stackhouse, uh, Brandon Jennings, Carmelo Anthony, mm -hmm. just who were some guys that uh, – you would say like maybe some unsung heroes, some guys that people don't really talk about that you coach. Yeah, I mean, we've had 300, close to 300 Division One players. So mm. uh, I had a kid back in the 80s, Alex Blackwell. I don't know if you've all ever heard of him. He went to Monmouth College. He ended up playing for the Lakers for a couple of years. A guy wow. like him. Uh, there's guys I look on the wall because we've got a wall uh, banner up in the wall uh, in the gym that's got all the all Americans on it. And, uh, of course, some of the guys are – more prominent than others, obviously. It's, even when you sure. go way back, my guys don't know those guys from even 15 years back. They don't sure. they're always ask me, who's that guy? Who's that guy? And I end up telling them, we played 12 years in the NBA. You don't yeah. know who he is. They don't, I mean, they don't, they don't know. But um, sure. there's guys on that wall that never made it. You know, that when they were yeah. in high school, they're supposed to be, if you're a McDonald's All-American, you should be an NBA player. If you're, the, I mean, supposedly, if you're ranked yeah. properly, if you're rated properly, and you continue to mature and grow as a player, if you're in the top 20 in your class, and surely you're going to make the NBA. Well, I've got guys on that list that didn't make it, you know, and then that's why they don't know those guys. I've got guys not on that list, like an Alex Blackwell that did make it, you know, and, and uh, 
So I've had other guys. I, one guy comes to mind lately, Josh Reeves played for us about eight years ago. He's played some in the NBA. Those guys have come through here and they exceed expectation. Then there's others that maybe don't reach the ex expectation you think they're going to have. But a lot of that's hard work. A lot of that's you know what the kid's made up of. Um, is he staying out of trouble? Is he doing the right things? You know, a lot of things come into play. If those guys make it or not at the highest level. Yeah. Sure. Coach, I'm a little curious. Um, you know, you talk about the relationships that you have with your players and whatnot. Um, so just building up this, this powerhouse and just having the pedigree that you guys do at Oak Hill, like how, how were you able to decide that, you know, 2021 or 21, 22 was going to be your final season? And, and, and how did, how did your guys that are, you know, on the roster now take the news? Yeah. I've been thinking about the last two or three years and, uh, five years ago, I thought about it. Then I, I was only 60 at the time. I'm 66 now. I turned 66 last September. Uh, right. The last couple of years I've been thinking about it. The game's changed a little bit. Um, you know, there's a lot of things you got to deal with that you didn't have to deal with. Most of these guys have an entourage now. <laughs> They're really oh, good ones. <laughs> trainers, mentors, and family yeah. members that are more involved. Um, that part I don't like dealing with. You know, I like I like getting the kids in here, coaching them, having a relationship with them, mm -hmm. having a season, not worrying about all this other stuff. Uh, so the stuff that you got to do outside of basketball – kind of wears on you a little bit. Um, but I thought about it, especially last year. I said, you know, you know, probably maybe another year or two. Then this year in the fall, I decided I think this might be the last go around. So that's what I ended up deciding. And it's been a good, it's been a good year. We've had a good, we started out a little slow and, uh, but we played really well of late. We've won 19 games in a row. Uh, I don't know how it's going to be this week because we had a spring break. Chris has not been with the team. Right. Livingston, our best player, mm, he hadn't been with us for three, almost three weeks. So mm -hmm. when we finished our season, then we had, uh, I think, March 12th, they all went home for break. They came back last last week. But Chris was at the McDonald's game on Friday, so he hasn't been in practice with us. So we've got to incorporate him in. Hopefully he'll be there tomorrow. I, uh, I think he gets in around 10 o'clock in the morning. We practice at 1, so I think we'll have him for a practice tomorrow. Try to refresh his mind a little bit, go over the game plan with him, what we want to do, and um, get him indoctrinated with the rest of the team because we've been practicing without him. Um, but I've had to do that before other years. But sure. just the way the Geico falls, it's after our spring break, so it's never ideal for us. But And all these teams have guys in the McDonald's game. I think there's like 11 guys in the Geico that are in the McDonald's game. Yeah. I, I hear some of them are not playing tonight. Some of them might. That are not playing McDonald's game may not play Geico. I don't know. I don't know if they're hurt or they're or they're sitting out for the Geico or not. they usually don't do that. They usually mm -hmm. play at McDonald's, so they may be some guys injured or sick. I don't know. I just getting some reports that there's some guys not playing tonight. So interesting. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, yeah, uh, go ahead, Ani. No, nah, uh, you made a you made an interesting point talking about how uh, the whole dynamic of the game has changed, where guys have on the rise or you know people kind of make more decisions outside of like the immediate family. When did you start seeing that kind of the shift in like where, where it was before to now? Uh, when I first took over, I was in charge of all the recruiting, you know, the coaches would call me and they'd recruit me to get the player. So I don't miss that, but that was, that's how it was back then. And, uh, and the parents might be involved, maybe a mom or a dad or maybe both. Mm -hmm. usually just one and that was about it now today you have all you know you got an AU yeah. coach you got a former high school coach if they transferred to me you got their parents you got grandparents you got trainers you got guys in their ear besides you know guys that are around them um mm -hmm. tell them to do this do that so that's really changed I would say in the last oh six eight years it's gotten in 10 years maybe it's gotten to be and then the coaches don't – they don't even call me. Even when they come to Oak Hill, they just show up. They'll just walk in the door, hey, coach. And it used to be they'd call you. You set it all up. I mean, they just yeah. bounce in and out now. It's totally changed. And I tell them, you're, when you recruit me, you're recruiting the wrong guy. And I try mm -hmm. to tell them – they might ask me who should I be recruiting. Yeah. Make sure they're recruiting – have a chance at the kid. And I'll say, here's who you need to talk to. This is who controls yeah. that kid. This is who's <laughs> going to help them make the decision. So – that's really changed in the last eight, 10 years. So. 
then I used to, I remember going home after practice and we used to practice in the evenings. Um, we'd go to school all day. We'd have to study all at six o'clock. We'd practice at seven 30. Well, I'd be in my office till 12 every day. I mean, till midnight every night. Mm-hmm. That's when my kids were growing up. Um, I was never at home like I should be. My house is right across the street, but I was in here talking to coaches because they were here all the time. They were calling me or I had to return calls because I taught school back then. So it took a lot of time. So I don't miss that part of it. Um, Mm -hmm. But I also worry about some of these guys sometimes getting bad advice Mm -hmm. from the wrong people. So especially if you coach them and you get close to them and you want what's best for them and you see people tell them the wrong things. And so it's, it's changed a lot. Uh, a lot of them have good people around them, but some of them don't. Um, sure. You hope that they all have, they listen to the right people. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks That's probably why this make kids transferring too. Um, they get bad advice, you know, and of course now with the portal, you can leave. You, know, right. you don't have to sit out a year. So now it's, wow, it's, it's free agency. You know, it's just mm-hmm. right. it's crazy. Uh, and then you got the N- NIL. So, oh, it's really changed. Yeah, that makes a, a a big difference, and obviously, there's more goes into the more work. You, you, let's talk about this team a little bit, Coach. I saw you guys in, in Arizona. Obviously, you did not play well. No, you know, you guys did not play well in Arizona at, at, at the Phoenix Sun Stadium. Um, you said, like you said, Chris Livingston hasn't been with you, and and you guys got a terrific team in Link, a four versus five game. You know, what changed, and uh, you know, how do you guys feel going into this game? Took us a while to get them to play together. Some teams adapt quicker than others. Obviously, it's a new team every year at Oak Hill. We have new yeah. players, um, so some mesh better than others, and some mesh quicker than others. And uh, we lost the game early against Greensboro Day. Chris was hurt and didn't play. I think if he played, we would have won the game. But we ended up losing my point there, so that kind of started the whole process. And then we came out of the shoot. We had a fall break of ten days, and we had three, four practices, and we had to go down to Mount Verde, and we lost three straight games. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then the very next week was out to Arizona, so we we couldn't get we couldn't get things right early on. We weren't playing well together. The ball was sticking on offense. Uh, they weren't connecting on defense. And then we then we went down to City of Palms and started to play a little better. And um, gotcha. we beat Whitney Young uh, first round. We played um, a team out of Louisiana that won the state championship. We beat them by about thirty. We beat Whitney Young by like thirty. We beat down IMG in the semifinals. We had Montverde down six for three minutes to go in the championship game. So we had like a complete turnaround in a week's time. Wow. Uh, then we came back after our Christmas break. We lost to La Lu up in Indiana and haven't lost since. So mm-hmm. I think from about the middle of December after the Arizona debacle, um, I mean, if Ronnie was at that game, Yeah. I mean, we didn't play well. Uh, we weren't in a position. The officials kind of let the game be physical, and we weren't physical at all. We had yeah. no chance after about the first five minutes the way we were playing mm-hmm. because they came out and played really hard, and they were physical. We weren't. We backed down, and we got beat by like 20, 25 points. So, uh, but since then, I mean, like the Montmore game was close. The Lalu game, we didn't play particularly well, but um, we were down like six with a couple minutes to go and um, – Ended up losing that game, but then from that point on, you know, we played Roselle Catholic. We played Lalu a week later and beat them, and have gone on a roll and played pretty well. Um, so we like our chances. Um, Chris is pretty healthy. Hopefully, he doesn't get hurt tonight. <laughs> so we'll have our team at full strength uh, yeah. on Thursday. They've got a guy sitting out tonight, from what I've heard, not playing. So uh, mm. Phillips. Uh, yeah, Julian. Yeah, supposedly he's sick or something. I don't mm-hmm. know. That's correct. Um, there's a couple others I know that are sitting out. I'm not going to give their names, but sure. Um, if two of them, two of them are on the same team, if they don't play, it's going to be a long night for them at the Geico tournament because I'm. Yeah. So, they're, the, they're the bulk of their team, but they're not playing tonight <laughs> either. So, um, but I don't want to say something that gets all over the internet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Let's <laughs> know I got my whole team. I would yeah. guess. That Talk a little team. bit about that. Just how. Proud are you, or how excited is it of you that like Geico's just a lot better? Anybody could beat anybody. You guys are losing a little bit more games than you used to in a, yeah. in a season, and that's because the teams are just better. And, and a lot yeah. of them have taken your lead. Have coaches called you to ask you, like, Coach, how did you build your program to that? I'm sure you know. Wh- what do you tell coaches? Yeah. You don't want to give away all your all your secrets, but yeah. what do you tell other coaches that call you? 
Yeah, I still get calls, even though I'm retiring. I get, I got a call last week from a coach. How do you start your program? How do you do this? How do you get your players? How to? Yeah. How do you do your schedule? Blah blah blah. Um, yeah. I mean, way back it was literally in the '80s, even into the '90s. Yeah. Uh, you'll probably remember Flint Hill up in yeah. Virginia. Flint Hill was really good. Um, other than that, you had the New England prep schools, but those were mostly post grad kids. Sure. If the kid was leaving. It was either I'm going to stay home or I'm going to Oak Hill. If I'm staying home, I'm going to Flint Hill. They weren't going anywhere else. There was no competition. Mm -hmm. So we got a lot of players, and we got things rolling. And uh, then you had – I mean, there wasn't Montverde. There wasn't IMG. There wasn't Wasatch. There was a lot of – they had schools, but they didn't have their athletic programs like they do now. So now you have all these schools, uh, but there are more players moving. Um, it's hard – it's – it's a rarity now when you see a top hundred kids stay at the same school four years. Right. You, yeah. you look, I mean, it's, they just don't stay. Even the public school kids are bouncing around. Uh, mm -hmm. Public schools, people accuse the private schools, but I've watched the public schools do things that the private schools never do. <laughs> the <changing> address. <laughs> That's true. Moving guys around and, and they do crazy stuff. Um, yeah. So kids are leaving all the time now. It's like normal. It's almost mm -hmm. like, I think now, and we haven't been, I've done it the same way the whole time. Yeah. I've answered that phone and the, the guys I've made contacts with the years contact me. I think now it's got changed. I mean, the, the next coach in there is probably going to have to recruit like crazy because these other schools, if I go to AAU event, very seldom do I go. But when I do go, they're all there. Their yeah. whole staffs mm -hmm. are there. Right. They're under the basket like a college coach is. I mean, they're recruiting these kids like crazy. So it's just changed. And the kids all want to play at the highest level. Uh, they're all want, especially the good ones. They all want to get the pros as quick as they can, so they think mm -hmm. the best route is, I need to go to No Kill, I need to go to Montbird, I need to go to IMG, I need to go to wherever, um, sure. to play against the best teams, and speed this process up. And right. so, it's changed. Everybody's moving now. Everybody's transferring. Whether it's good or not, that's what they're doing. It's not going to change. Mm -hmm. so we're not. They're not going back to the old days. I'm just telling you, it's not going to be that way. Right. And so, kids are moving and. People can complain all they want, but that's just how it's going to be. And right. now the teams are really good. I mean, the Geico tournament, I'd say seven of the eight teams could win that tournament this week. I mean, Sunrise yeah, is yeah. good. They're number one, but they're not a lock. Um, no. Mm -hmm. you know, some years you look at the tournament going, this team, unless they get upset, they're probably going to win. You know, yeah. they, you look at Montverde some of those years. Um, you know, you look, some of the better teams you're going out of that, they're going to win this tournament. Even as good as the rest of us are, we probably can't beat them unless something happens. And, you know, this year I think it's completely different. Uh, Luke, may, Luke may get mad at me, Luke Barwell from uh, Sunrise, but I think he probably knows too. He's not a – he can't just roll in there and play average and win. So you got to play well. And the team that plays well the next three days is going to win that tournament. And uh, it could be anybody, to be honest. Uh, I think if we play well, we have a chance every game because we played since middle of December. Every game we played has been – against the best teams that's been close. Um, sure. Nobody, we're not getting blown out anymore like we did early on. And uh, even after we lost to Montverde, at Montverde, the first game in the NIBC by about 35, the next night we were ahead of Sunrise by four with two minutes to go and turned the ball over, um, three straight mm -hmm. possessions. So even the very next night we almost beat Sunrise and they're number one in the country. Yep. Uh, and then the next night we had IMG down at the end of three quarters. So, then we beat IMG later. So I mean, we, everybody's got a chance. Um, you got to play well. And I mean, Bradley's not playing, you know, with IMG, he's hurt. Right. Uh, Mom Bird lost a big kid back in early January. Um, so that doesn't help them. Um, there's just, everybody's had some injuries and or transfers or whatever. Uh, we've, yeah. we've been together now. This group's been together now, you know, a whole second semester barring injuries and we haven't had any. So we're healthy. Just a matter of we got to play well tomorrow. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Or Thursday, excuse me. We got to play well Thursday because Link's very good, and everybody's kind of not sure about Link because they they, you know, they're saying, well, they weren't in the NIBC. They didn't play y'all schedule. They've lost one game. Yeah. Yeah, and they played Sunrise and they lost. Okay, but they have beaten some good teams. Uh, they have. Personnel is high level. I mean, they've got as good a player as anybody in our league. So, yeah, if they were in our league, they might have dropped another game or two. Who knows? Um, but they're still really, really good. So um, that's probably why they're a four seed instead of a two seed. You know, on paper, they're probably the two seed. Uh, yeah. We're probably, on paper, we're the five seed, but that's because we played a great schedule and we played well lately. Right. Um, so we've got mm -hmm. a higher seed than maybe some people thought we'd have. So 
I don't politic for that. I didn't. I thought we were going to end up playing IMG. To be honest, I thought that was the seed we would have and be matched up with them. And that I don't know if it's a better matchup or not. Who knows? Uh, yeah. You know, we'll see Thursday. I might get out there in the middle of the first quarter going, "Yo, what are we in here for?" So, <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll see because I have not seen them play except on film. I've watched sure. some games. Obviously, we have a scouting report. We're gonna have a game plan. Uh, We'll see how it goes. I mean, a 32-minute high school game goes by pretty quick. You got to play well, yeah, sure. and you're you're done. If you lose, you're done. So uh, we're down to that point. At least there's eight teams left playing. We're still one of them. So we're excited to be playing. For sure. Yeah, that, that, it's going to be a great tournament. We, we can't wait to watch. Let's talk a little bit about the past, Coach. Um, you you mentioned I, I went to to your guys last ceremony. You guys, uh, 2012. You're well, the Fab 50 champs, and we did a story on ESPN, and we talked about your five most unsung players we've talked about the carmelos and and those guys but the five most unsung players we we talked about at that time 10 years i can't believe it's past that fast yeah was anthony cade steve blake vincent hamilton ron slay and orlando vega would you add anybody in the last 10 years to that group is like man that guy was really good and he really helped us win yeah um those are good ones too because i mean they were good players but there were most people don't know who they are right now. Correct. They don't know Anthony mm, In my opinion, yeah. he's top ten player ever played here. Not one one of my players knows who he is. I got to tell every one of them who he is. Even coach mm. come in and go, who's Anthony K? They look at the wall, you know, and they know most of the names, but because uh, he didn't really go, do anything, uh, past O'Kelly, he, he never went to college and yeah. uh, played some mm. European ball, but not much. But he was a phenomenal player. But um, I mean, I, la- lately. Trying to think of some guys. Those guys stand out, obviously. Vincent Hamilton was a yeah. guy that went through here and was – he's one of the few guys in the Big 12. At the time he did it, he had 2,000 points, 1,000 rebounds, and like I think it was 200 blocks. It mm. was him, him, Will Chamberlain, and Danny Manning, the only three players in Big 12 history ever to do it. Well, nobody knows who Vincent Hamilton is, but he was the player of the year in the Big 12 his senior yeah. year. Yeah. Um, Ron Slay was the SEC player of the year. At yeah. Tennessee, his senior year, and uh, you probably saw him because we came to California, played Dominguez, and yeah, uh, some of those teams when we had Ron Slay and Travis Watson. I would put Travis in that, maybe Travis maybe. Watson in that list too. He was yeah. a really good player that most people don't know about. Um, I'm sure I could. I'm trying to look at my wall over here. It's got all the plaques on it of the players and the team, <laughs> and there's guys up there. I'm sure uh, Lindell Wigginton stands out. I mean, everybody knows his name, but. Yeah, uh, and he's not an NBA guy, but he's played a little bit this year. He's had a couple con- ten day contracts, and yeah. he might make it one day. Um, and that was very good. Yeah, I remember yeah. he played good against that Mallow Ball game. He's from Canada, right? He's from. Yeah. Yeah. He had thirty five points against the Mallow Balls team out yep. in Modern Day when we they had a sixty get five game win streak when we beat him, and yep, he was probably the reason we beat him. Uh, to be honest, we had Billy Preston on that team, uh-huh. yeah, uh, who never reached his potential and you know, for various reasons, but. Uh, Lindell was was the guy that won that game for us, and uh, he did. There's been lots of guys. Um, Jordan Adams, and we did. Was he on that list? Uh, Jordan was not on that list. Yeah, on the 2012 yeah. team, he's probably one of your best shooters, right? Yeah, he was one of the best shooters we ever had. Uh, they went on to UCLA and had a good career there. So we've had some guys go through that, and I'm sure I've had a couple in the last few years. I just can't think about top of my head. Sure, sure. Let's talk about the the, the teams you guys played. And, and on that same list, we talked about the players you went up against. And like you said, the, there's more good teams now, nowadays. So back then in 2012, 10 years ago, you, you had number one, LeBron, which is not a surprise. Yeah. Derrick Rose, you guys played, I think, in Chicago. Number two, Paul Pierce, who might be a little surprising to some people, but I know you guys played him in Vegas. Yeah. And Paul was really good in high school. Yeah. And, uh, four, you had T-Mac. Um, five, you had Mana, Alice, and Just Missed. You mentioned those Dominguez teams with Tyson Chandler, Lamar Odom. They Lamar beat Odom. you guys in Oak Hill. Yeah. So would you add anybody to one of these latest NIBC teams, oh, oh, Montverde, oh, IMGs, anybody on that level, those five or seven guys? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I know Ben Simmons can't shoot, but he was a phenomenal high school player. I mean, he yeah. dominated for three years. He was at Montverde, uh, more so than like R.J. Barrett. Uh yeah, he did. Whitehead's a good, really good player now for Montverde, but he's not a dominating guy. He'll he'll pass and share the ball. Um, you know, he's not a guy that's just trying to get his and showcase his ability, but he's a really good player. But I'm thinking those guys from Montverde, um, 
man, I, I just thought McGrady was so good in high school. Um, I always put Lamar on him right on the cusp of that list because he came in here and he's the only guy that gave us a, a defeated Oak Hill until a couple of years ago we lost to West Oaks. We've lost two games in 39 years at home that I've been the wow. coach. And Lamar was the one that gave us the one loss in uh, 1997. And, uh, and then we lost to West Oaks, I guess, 2018. So it, they lose a home game about once every 20 years here. Hopefully that'll continue to happen while I leave. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a couple close ones. We had one, we had a close yeah. one issue with the Burlington School. Um, but I'm thinking individual guys that have played recently. The Montbirds had the really good guys. They've had, yeah, I guess they've had four Naismith winners in the last seven, eight years. Um, but I wouldn't put any of those guys above the guys that I mentioned earlier. Um, yeah. Nothing's changed. No, I don't think no. so. Yeah, I would say that that makes sense. Those guys are obviously legendary players and went on to legendary, you know, NBA. LeBron, I always tell everybody LeBron was the best I'd ever seen. Um, you know, we played him when he was a sophomore and he was, people knew who he was, but this was, we're talking 19, it was 2000. It would have been January of 20, of 2001, I think. Sure. We played him in Columbus and, uh, or 2000. And, uh, you know, wasn't the internet was around, but it wasn't like nowadays and people didn't have film of him and, and all that. And so we showed up for the game and it was in Columbus, Ohio. And I come out and watch the layup line. We're warming up and they're warming up on the end of the floor where I'm sitting on the bench and I see him out there and I'm like, he's 15 years old. Yeah. He's probably six, eight, mm. 30. And I'm going, that guy is a 15 year old kid. And I'm watching him in the warm up line. I'm like, this guy is a full grown man. And the game starts. <laughs> And they got five sophomores and we got five seniors and we're number one in the country. And they were still, they were ranked like top five. Yeah. They finished the season number two because they almost beat us. We beat him by one point and he had 33 points. And uh, that was kind of his coming out party after he did that against us with all our seniors. And, you know, we had a loaded team and uh, then everybody said, Oh man, this guy must be legit. And then we played him again the next year and I had Carmelo and that was a, uh, historical game because those two guys went at each other. We ended up winning that game and Melo had 34 and I think LeBron had 36. And then his senior year, we played him in Cleveland and that was a mistake. We didn't, I got off the bus, we were in trouble. <laughs> so, <laughs> we didn't win that game. We won the prior two, but he had 30, I think 31. So he had, he actually played as well as the sophomore and the juniors. He did his, his senior against us, but uh, yeah. he, just physically and the way he played mm -hmm. and his skill level, He's the best I've seen in high school. Um, even as a sophomore, I thought when I saw him, I go, this might be the best player I've ever seen. And at that point, I'd, I'd had some really good players at Oak Hill, too. Uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, I had Ron Mercer, who was a Naismith Award winner. And since then, I had Brandon Jennings, a, a Naismith Award. Some of my better players didn't win the Naismith. Mello didn't win it, but should have. They gave yeah. it to Raymond Felton that year. Um, <laughs> that's a story in itself. <laughs> they called me the night before. Oh, wow. the night before they gave the award, they told me, Oh, we're gonna announce Carmelo tomorrow and USA yeah. Day is a Naismith more winner. Oh, it's great. You know, I'm like, oh, we got another winner. Yeah. The next day I get the paper and it says Raymond Felton. I'm like, what happened from eight o'clock last night to when I got my paper at eight o'clock in the morning? But mm -hmm. I heard some politics went on and I don't know. Oh wow. Rest in peace, John Rhodes is a good friend of mine, but I know he made a call. <laughs> <laughs> he was kind of his mentor. And I think he had yeah. Dean Smith make a call. And next thing you know, it snowballs and they give it to Raymond Felton. But Oh boy. I think it's ended up and people know Mello's a little better player than Raymond Felton it turned out to be. But uh, so I've had other guys that I thought, yeah. you know, Stackhouse could have won it the year uh, in 93. Uh, sure. We've had other guys. Uh, Brandon won it that year, but if he's a different year, he might not have won it. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, Mercer won it over Kevin Garnett. So, yeah. But then he got hurt later on. Garnett had a better career, but so it, you never know. But uh, I've had some really good players through the years. But uh, as far as the guys we played against, LeBron's been the best. Got you. Got you, coach. Um, you know, as we wrap up here, uh, did you have you, you did you enjoy the ride as much as you like? Or were you always getting phone calls? Uh, I, we got to prepare for the next game. We got to get a, you guys travel as much as a college team. Did you did you were able to enjoy it as a 30 year old man? For yeah. yeah, I enjoyed it. Uh, okay. It's been great. Uh, I got no regrets. Yeah. And I think I'll probably enjoy it when I after this weekend's over and I'm sitting back relaxing. Yeah, in my on the recliner, golf course. yeah, on the golf. Oh, you know, the first year <laughs> my recliner watching games, I'll probably think about it a little more and, and 
and remember all the the fun times. And uh, of course, the relationship with the players has been great. I still have. I mean, the players were calling me like crazy when I announced I was leaving. They're like, "You can't be leaving." You can't. I mean, they thought I coached until I was a hundred. I guess I don't know. <laughs> and some coaches coach longer now. You know, a lot of people when they turn sixty five, they'd retire. And nowadays, you got guys in their seventies and up. Mm-hmm. I saw Leonard Hamilton just signed a contract. He's like seventy eight. And I'm like, if he, if he goes through that contract, he's going to be 84 when he quits. Ooh. So I know those guys that do it longer. And Gary McKnight's still doing it. He's about my age. Uh, yeah. I think Gary just wants to pass me. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I'll shake his head. He can go by me if he wants to. I'm going to be on the first tee. I'll be enjoying myself. <laughs> so, play with my grandkids. And I've got two boys that are – two grandkids that are five and seven. They, uh, they'll miss the games because they love coming to my games now. They're from – they live in Nashville. So we might retire – and moved to Nashville. My daughter works for the Tennessee Titans, so I can mm. go to football games on the weekend. And uh, wow! So, and it's a pretty, Nashville's a great place. So, uh, I have a hard time leaving my log cabin up here, but uh, I thought about keeping it as well and coming up here in the summers like everybody else does. But we'll see. I don't have made a decision on that yet. But uh, yeah, I've enjoyed it and I have no regrets whatsoever. Got you. Awesome. That's so awesome, Coach. Well, we. Coach, we want to take up a little more of your time. You know, we could talk for another hour. Right. But we, no we, problem. We, yeah, we got. I get rambling and start telling stories. You won't cut me off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we won't. Yeah. <laughs> we won't. I love if you it. Ha- if you want me when I retire, I'll be glad to get on. Give me something to do. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Coach. Right. Thank you for your time. Thank uh, you, guys. Good luck. Appreciate this you guys. All right, I appreciate that. Okay. Thanks, Coach. All right. Take thank care. you. Bye-bye. Bye. You guys see uh, – Coach could talk about a lot of different things. Uh, I wanted to mention one thing, and and he doesn't talk talk about it too much, but I'm sure he would talk about it now he retires. Is some of the guys he turned down because he like he mentioned uh, he didn't have to recruit that much in his in his when yeah. he was rolling. Like people would call him, and he turned down like he turned down OJ Mayo. He's turned down some other guy. He's turned down some he turned down some NBA Hall of Famers. Like I'll tell you, wow. like, because again, you would think like. I don't think the information traveled like it does now, right? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. you you know, you take a phone call from a kid and you're like, why is he leaving? Is he in trouble? Is he a troublemaker? Like, he did a pretty good job of waiting it out, you know? Like, they didn't have a lot of troublemakers. I know he had uh, some guys in his early days. They were almost all from New York. I don't know if people know the background. Like, Oak Hill had a lot of New York players because um, they wanted to get their academics straight. I think that's why mm-hmm. Rod Strickland went there. Uh, you guys, I don't know if you heard of Lloyd Daniels, but he's like a great player, a great yeah. legend, and he didn't have any high school transcript. And he went to Oak Hill for a while, and then he got kicked out. So I think he got smarter mm-hmm. and like wiser and cleaned those guys out. Like towards his later years, Oak Hill had a better reputation, probably like by the mid '90s, and like he cleaned that up a lot. So, and then from yeah. there, he grew the the whole, um, you know, like all. all all the teams had to keep up with him, whether it was public school or not. And I, I, he mentioned they used to come out to California a lot in the nineties and two thousands. And then the CIF didn't allow them to play Oak Hill no more, but like he played the good Westchester teams with Trevor Reza and those guys, they played the Dominguez teams with Tyson mm-hmm. Chandler. Those were huge games. Like yeah. those were always the barometer. So it was always fun to see, you know, and, and yeah, he's played like the, the guys he's just played against is pretty amazing. You know, he mentioned T Mac, Paul Pierce. I think Paul Pierce would be the one guy people were like, Paul Pierce, like he was really good. He was it's really just, good. <laughs> as good. I just think people on the West Coast don't like Paul Pierce because they still relate him to the Celtics and they're like, no, he's not that good. Like, <laughs> right. dude was really good, you know? So very interesting. I don't know. Do you guys have any comment about like his career or like what you remember about Oak Hill? Chelsea, I'm trying to look up who, who was on that Cheyenne team. Well, well, I just remember Brandon Jennings. Like, he's the most prominent. And that's because we're around the same age. So, sure. at the time, he was blowing up. And, yeah. you know, he was kind of the most prominent, like, Oak Hill face um, that I can think of. Because, like I said, we're, like, the same class. Yeah. Um, but other than that, like, you know, Coach has incredible stories. He gave my my guy, Bron, his flowers. So, you know, I was just smiling ear from ear. Uh, listening to his LeBron stories and how great he was because, you know, that's my yeah. goat and, you know, that's yeah. how I feel about him. So um, I think that's pretty awesome. And just, you know, it's just incredible to just to do so many decades of basketball and just to be able to witness, yeah. you know, how these players have progressed and prospered. And, you know, he kind of answered one of my questions without, you know, asking just of, you know, players are going to Oak Hill to get to the league. 
Like, you know, that's really the only reason that you go there. And, you know, he talked about, you know, sometimes it doesn't pan out and you get these McDonald's All-Americans that were supposed to make it and they don't make it. Um, And so just how he was able to navigate, you know, what was happening with his players and just, you know, obviously everybody kind of having the same objective of just being a competitive team and winning, but also, you know, getting guys in the NBA. So I, I definitely respect it. Um, and I, I think it was incredible kind of just listening and, you know, ch- him, him chiming in on our stories. Sure. What do you think, Ani? Yeah, I mean, I <clears throat> took us to like a historical timeline. It was pretty dope. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. You know, I remember Oak Hill really specifically with that Carmelo. Uh, yeah. mm-hmm. I remember when they televised the him and LeBron matchup. And like, I remember what I think ESPN like replayed that game multiple times so I would watch it over and over and over again so that was like my time where I really got to know about Oak Hill and uh um, yeah. you know he just coached a lot of players <laughs> you know big mm-hmm. time players he you know he made a comment you it made you really think it was like it's a lot of division one guys coaches that haven't coached pros yeah. you know he's like I coached about 40 of them <laughs> uh, yeah you know it's just you know for him especially in the period of time that he's coached and just how many mcdonald's all americans division one players and nba players i mean that's just a testament for to his work i mean it was just it was just it was just cool i like i'm just like the kid just listening you know yeah. <laughs> uh it was, sure. it was it's pretty great yeah so if you guys want to get more background on the listeners out there episode 62 he came down came on of the in the paint show and we had kevin boyle on Uh, We talked about the greatest high school teams of all time. They were kind of, we had four guests on. We were kind of going back and forth. We actually talked about the Baltimore Dunbar. We had a player from that Baltimore Dunbar call in. He talked about it. And then the fourth team was the Chino Hills team with, with Malo O Mm -hmm. and and those guys, Mm -hmm. Uh, their coach, Steve Bate came on and kind of gave his, but kind of, they were kind of like the, um, I guess that would be the four seed of those four teams. They would definitely (laughs) be the four seed, you know, like we talked, we talked, Kevin Boyle talked about his, 220 team with Cade and with Scotty Barnes in, in that group, which was a really good group that didn't get a chance to play Geico because of the pandemic, but they did show during the season how dominant they were. Mm-hmm. And, and I saw Oak Hill's team in 93, and I saw the Carmelo team and the more recent teams. And that he doesn't say it a lot because he has guys, his friends and stuff, but like he knows his 93 team is his best team. And I think his 2004 team is really good too. Uh, Ray John Rondo, Josh Smith, oh. uh, Casey Rivers. They were really good. I mean, they beat some good teams. They came out to California and they rolled. Uh, and the 93 team came to Vegas. Uh, I, I don't know if you remember, Chelsea, you, you were probably in grade school and middle school. I was uh, I was Las three. Vegas, huh? so no, I was no, three. No, 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 no. <laughs> one. <laughs> and later, I'm talking about in later times. That, that's okay. Where, no, I do. Okay. The Las Vegas Invitational, that's where they played, I think, McGrady and them. In the mid nineties to the early two thousand, that was a huge tournament. Like both those I, w- I was at the tournaments at a young age because my dad was a high school basketball coach. So I definitely, from probably age eight, so yeah. I'll say definitely ninety eight. Yeah. Um, I started going to all, all the tournaments, and you know, in yeah. Vegas, we host a lot with just we had the big time and the Easter yeah. Classic and all those sure. you know tournaments. So yeah. I, I'm sure I've seen it. You know, it escapes me now. But Oak Hill, in my mind, yeah. just Brandon Jennings because you know we were the same same age. Same so group. yeah, yeah. No, I knew you had seen the 93 team. I'm just saying the tournament was really good, and he would bring his team all the way probably to like 2001, 2002 mm-hmm. uh, during the season. During the season, you know, Las Vegas invitation was huge. They they won it a few times, and uh, you know, Tracy McGrady's team beat uh, Jerron and Jason Collins one year. Mm-hmm. And the the Mount Zion team came. That was pretty cool, you know. So you got to see a lot of guys just either in LA for me, LA or Vegas. So great times, but. We kind of mentioned a great guy and a great coach moving on. Let's finish up when we wrap. We have another situation that's similar like that in college. Obviously, Coach K, he's kind of they're trying to win in their in his last year, and he's kind of had that similar. He's He's been around at Duke pretty much a little bit longer than Steve Smith been around at Oak Hill. Mm-hmm. And in my opinion, I'm watching the last couple of weeks, like Duke is really playing well. I think mm-hmm. they're playing offensively well. These other teams go through lows. I'm like, oh my God, well, when are these guys going to score? Why can't they get a bat, easy basket? Mm-hmm. Like, Duke hasn't had that problem. Like, they're scoring well. What, what do you guys take so far out now that we're into the final four? Similar to the girls' side, it's the heavyweights, it's a blue blood final four. What is your guys' take? Chelsea, you go. Okay. Um, so, my first take is Duke is playing their best basketball of the season. 
I mean, yeah. I've watched the highs and the lows of this team. I think uh, losing to North Carolina um, in the ACC championship was probably the best thing that – or not ACC championship, I'm sorry, um, Coach K's final homecoming yeah. um, game in Cameron, uh, final home game. Uh, losing to them kind of just, you know, gave them the embarrassment that they needed to, to step it up. Um, so, you know, Duke is playing fantastic. Um, I think they have the number one pick in Paolo Benchero. I believe that's how you say his mm -hmm. name. Um, he's been incredible, uh, very impressive. Um, so I, I think Duke is kind of right on pace. Uh, when I look at UNC, I don't know if UNC is playing great, but they're playing good enough. Um, you know, their last game versus St. Peter's, uh, just too much size, too much athleticism out there. Um, you know, St. Peter's was a great, you know, Cinderella story. Uh, coming in as a really, really high seed. But ultimately, they ran into, you know, what's kind of like an NBA team in comparison to them. Everybody was just tall and long, and, and it really bothered them. And we didn't see that the first couple rounds when they, you know, beat Kentucky um, and had a couple wins. Um, and then when I look at Kansas and Villanova, like I, I, Villanova, it just so much reminds me of Stanford. And I say that because Villanova is like the team that you have to beat them. They're not going to beat themselves. Right. They don't make a whole bunch of mistakes. Everybody's helping and rotating and not, you know, getting out of position. And it's very fundamental basketball. Even when I watch them play on offense, they have really solid guards. Don't turn the ball over like crazy. Anytime they get into the paint, they're playing off of two feet. And, you know, it's really just textbook basketball. And then obviously you have Jay Wright, who's an excellent coach. Um, I do think they did take a blow. Uh, losing one of their best players. And I think Justin Moore uh, with an Achilles tear. So that kind of worries me. Um, that's why I think Kansas, um, just with their size and their athleticism um, and just, you know, their kind of pedigree are going to have a real chance in that game. I think Villanova's kind of uh, short roster now might hinder them. Um, so if I had to give my pick, um, I got Duke Kansas um, in the championship game. And I think it's just kind of written for Coach K to get his championship on the way out. Like, it's wow. it's a storyline. It's a narrative. He's getting his revenge against UNC, and he's going to finish it versus Kansas, and he's going to ride off into the sunset in retirement. So that's how I see it. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think uh, Duke wins it all. Um, you know, they've always been the most talented team, especially on paper. And like you said, it's been an up-and-down season. But Apollo, Mark Williams – uh, the uh, Trevor Keels, Wendell Moore, you know, you can keep going on. Uh, AJ Griffin, I mean, just really talented. I think they came together. I thought that Texas Tech game, I thought Tech was going to win that. Uh, That's what I wanted, you know, but right. And I'm a, I'm a homer because you know, I'm, you know I love it about five, six hours for me, but uh, uh, you know, I thought the physicality and just kind of Tech being a little bit older, I thought that was going to be a lot, but. Uh, Ronnie, you said it best. Like some of these teams have these lulls on the offensive end, yeah. and you know Duke can just hit you with so many pieces. Where even if they are in a little bit of a uh, you know just a downtime offensive, they have a go-to guy or guy. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, even Roach. <laughs> you know, Roach is you know, very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Like you, they have a lot of pieces. Where these other teams, I feel like they. You know they kind of go on these these offensive droughts, and they may not. I know Kansas has a bocce, and you know Christian Brown does a pretty good job. But like you know, some of these other teams have these offensive droughts. Yeah. Uh, where Duke can just hit you with so many players, and that's why I feel like they're going to win it all. But you know, yeah. Kansas, Villanova, like he says, they're like a well-oiled machine. They're tough. Mm -hmm. um, Coach going to make sure they're prepared for any matchup they have. Kansas can always be explosive, especially on both ends. Uh, UNC Duke. I mean, that's going to be a great game. UNC yeah. just playing, you know, peaking at the right time, and like Bacad and all of them, they're just they're just monsters in the paint. Um, so it's going to be a really good matchup. But I think Duke ends up winning the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to try to go against you, boy. I want to take somebody else. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to agree with you too. I know we're all putting our our, our prediction on the line. You no, know, I'm going to change mine. No, I'm going to change mine. <laughs> UNC is going to win that. Get all three. I'm going to go UNC. <laughs> well. But my thing with UNC is, like you said, it's kind of how they're playing. They've brought, gone into the right matchup. Obviously, getting St. Peter's was the right matchup for them. Like, yeah. they didn't even – at the middle of the, of the first half, they were just jacking through. It was like, they know they're going to win this game. This They they already knew that right. St. Peter's had no chance. You know what I mean? It just – the way they were they were playing. But the game before, I was like, man, are they going to win this game? You know, Langston mm -hmm. Love was hitting the threes. Mm -hmm. They were – they were – um. They was a it was a possession where they were 
up. Uh, they were, I think it was tied up three, and Love shot a three. He was way off, and Armando Baker saved the ball, got it back in, and Love hit another one. I was like, okay, they're going to win. And then – so, like, they've been kind of teetering, like – and obviously not in the St. Pete's game, but in the in the rounds before. And they, they go through blows where they're not playing good offensively. And I just don't yeah. see that happening to Duke. Like, yeah. And, I mean, just like the Baylor game. You even see that, what, the 25-point lead? And then right. we look up and we're like, what the <laughs> Oh, and, yeah, like so that was nuts. I don't know. Yeah. I, I think that UNC is very vulnerable. Um, yeah. I don't think they can beat Duke again. They got their victory win in Cameron, and that was their national championship. So yeah. it's over. They're 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 streaky. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, Man, love, that's a good word. Caleb Love. I said Langston Love. Caleb Love, obviously from St. Louis, is he's had a really some really big games, and some other yeah, times yeah. they just go through lulls. Um, but I, I don't see Duke going through that. Uh, I, I do see. Kansas getting by is let me ask you guys a question is Kansas kind of like being overlooked or they just kind of they, they don't have that big star power are they not playing the bet like they just ha are winning but like nobody's I don't know if nobody's talking about them or they're just that maybe they don't have the high uh you know this storyline that everybody's following and maybe everybody's following the the the, the tobacco road storyline well, is can Kansas come out and win this or is it are they just maybe getting the right matchups and it's worked out for them I think I think Kansas can. I think they're slightly overlooked. I mean, yeah. Obachi, Chris Brown, J uh, Jalen Wilson. You know, yeah, uh, you know, uh, Dallas kid. I mean, they're talented. Um, they don't have you know when you think of Kansas like tradition, like the Ben Macklemore's yeah. and the, you mm -hmm. know uh, Joel and Beads. You know, they've always kind of had that big name star power guy. With well, yeah. this year, it's just more of a compilation of guys, uh, yeah. but not like that you know, that huge name. So, but I think Kansas is very, very, very good. And then it's slightly overlooked. I just think on the other end, you just got, I think whoever wins that Duke-UNC matchup, which, you know, I changed my pick, but, you know, whoever that is. <laughs> I don't believe you changed your pick. You don't mean it. Yeah, you don't really mean uh, it. But, yeah, Duke, you know, I just think Duke just has too much. Yeah. No, I agree with you. And, and, and that's – I mean, you couldn't see, see – I just couldn't see that even a month ago. I'm like, that dudes, they're, they're okay. But right. then just the way the tournament broke and mm -hmm. some of the top teams lost, and, and then, you know, like Houston and, Bill, and then Villano has the injury. Villano, you know, Houston knocks off Arizona. And Gonzaga gets knocked off. I mean, we haven't talked much about Gonzaga, but they – Yeah, they yeah, didn't play they very good. Yeah, they a disappointing tournament. Yeah, they didn't play very good, and and, and just Duke's is like like you said. I think a little bit of the motivation, they've been there. Now, I didn't want to ask you. This seemed like Coach Cal got all the uh, recognition for working with one and Duns. Obviously, the Anthony Davis team mm -hmm. won it, but like, has Coach K just done as good or better job? Like with the one, like he's adapted to the one and Duns. He got he won with Jaleel Okafor and, right. and the and the Jones team, but like, has he done as good a job as anybody? Especially if they win this year, or like, I think he's done. Like I think he's done the best job of one and duns. I think yeah. they said, yeah. you know, obviously Coach Cal has that, yeah, you know, uh, reputation for it. But I think Coach K, especially when he goes for one and duns, they win, uh, yeah. and they exactly. go deep. You know, with Zion Williamson and, and that crew, uh, yeah. like you know, he's done a better job with one and duns going deeper in the tournament yeah. than uh, Coach Cal has. Yeah. Um, you know, in my yeah. opinion, yeah. Because you see the recruiting classes, you're like, oh, Coach Cal got another number one recruiting class. Right. Like, Coach K's done a really hell of a job because and I think he's the youngest team, right? They're the youngest team in this in this lot mm -hmm. left. Mm -hmm. And you don't expect that, but you look back at it and you're like, yeah, they won that one with, and he may win his sixth title. So we'll see if he wins his sixth title. Obviously, Steve Smith's going for his, you know, uh, would be his 10th title. So it'd be interesting. It's going to be an interesting and fun weekend. We're obviously going to watch. So we wanted to wrap up now. We appreciate you guys listening to the In the Paint show, uh, another edition. We appreciate Steve Smith talking and, and giving his his insight. And hopefully, you know, we'll have we'll have some great guests in the future talking about the spring and summer. Well, I'm sure we will, but we're still in high school. Right. Time's going by so fast. So we appreciate you guys listening in. I uh, appreciate your guys' time, Ani and Chelsea. Wanted to make sure everybody – uh, you know, logs into ballslife.com. Check out the other pods. Go to our Balls Life podcast network. We definitely want to uh, shout out those. You know, uh, Kicks of Your Life with Jordan McLaughlin, Noble, Noble and Roosh do a great job, Unapologetic and Buckets and Breaks Downs. But for now, I think we're logging off. Uh, Chelsea, Ani, and Ronnie, until next time. We appreciate it, guys. Peace. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.